Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Kraft, and on behalf of the Omega staff and community, I welcome you to this Omega Conversation. Very special event today. It's titled, The Earth is Alive, Regenerative Solutions for Hunger, Poverty, and Climate Change with Dr. Vandana Shiva. Uh, after I introduce her, uh, we'll speak for a while, and then we will uh, have some questions and answers in our last 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Um, if you have questions while we're while we're speaking or toward the end, uh, please post them in the chat and I will call on people or read the questions aloud. So before we start, uh, just a word in addition to the generosity of our speaker, we couldn't be doing these without the generosity of our supporters like you like you. And we ask that you continue to do the work of supporting Omega so that we can do our work of aiding the transformation and healing of our world. If you're interested in supporting Omega's work, please go to www.eomega.org slash membership and check out our membership options and how you can be part of our movement. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce someone who is a huge honor to be speaking with. Vandana Shiva is a world-renowned environmental thinker, activist, uh, I would say a contemplative who brings the reflection of nature uh, into a call to action, a, a true human being in the best sense, in that she is part of the earth and she leads us into a bigger vision, which is something we should all be doing for one another. Uh, Dr. Shiva is the founder of Nadanya, uh, the Research Foundation Science for Science, Technology, and Natural Research. She is a leader in an international forum on globalization. She's won countless awards, including the Right Livelihood Award, Save the World Award, Sydney Peace Prize, Calgary Peace Prize, the Thomas Merton Award, and the John Lennon Yoko Ono Grant for Peace. She's written many influential books, including Making Peace with the Earth, and her most recent book, at least in English, in America at least, uh, Agroecology and Regenerative Agriculture, Sustainable Solutions for Hunger, Poverty, and Climate Change. Dr. Shiva has done incredible work for women's rights around the world, for indigenous people and lifestyles, for native and heirloom seeds, and for life as a whole. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shiva. Vandana, welcome. Thank you. Uh, for those, your work is just extraordinary, but for those who are unfamiliar with it, would you please say a few words about how you came to be doing what you do in the, in the world? Well, I started out life um, inspired, of course, by nature. I grew up in the forests of the Himalaya, uh, but also inspired by Einstein as a young girl in one of the forest rest houses reading with a lantern. I found a little book on science and responsibility. And I said, that's the kind of person I want to be, to understand how nature works, but to live with responsibility in society. And then I kept following that, I, even though I went to schools that didn't teach physics, didn't teach higher maths. I taught myself all of that, finding teachers outside the school. And I got a science talent scholarship. I went on to do a PhD in foundations of quantum theory because that started life in our nuclear establishment. And my sister, who's a medical doctor, just asked me a few questions on radiation. And of course I knew nothing. And physics, you're taught how to solve equations fission equations, you're not taught anything about what radiation does to life. So I moved into quantum theory. And that's where I was, and I, you know, 100 years we've been solving the puzzles of quantum theory. I could have spent a, my lifetime doing it. But around that same time, this beautiful movement was starting in my region, Chipko, hugging the trees. And since I'd grown up in the forest and I saw a forest disappear, I said, I'm gonna volunteer for this movement. And I do it on all my vacations. I kept doing my PhD in Canada, but running back winter, summer, volunteering, learning. I say I went to a second university, which is not a university, which is the forests of the Himalaya, but the, my sisters of the Chipko movement. Because from them, I learned everything about biodiversity, how there's not a plant in the forest that is useless. And they knew every plant and its amazing ecological uses. And they were encyclopedias. They'd never been to school, not one day. They didn't know how to read or write. 
And they are the ones who made the connections long before we now talk ecological services. But they were telling the foresters, you think these are timber mines and you think their main product is money, but their main product is soil, water, and oxygen. Pure air, they'd say, in our language. Mitti pani bayar, the clean breath, the beautiful breath, bayar, beautiful breath. And they said, we're going to hug the trees because these forests protect us. So that taught me activism. It taught me ecology. It taught me how to function with, you know, they had no money, but they organized a decade long protest till logging was stopped in the Himalayas above 1,000. And then how did I end up with in agriculture? Because Punjab is where I'd done my MSc honors in particle physics in the 70, early 70s. But by 80s, it was erupting in violence. This is the land where the green revolution, so-called, not green, not revolutionary, application of war chemicals to agriculture by force, with all kinds of pretense that this was scientific and uh, everything before was unscientific. And it was fascinating narrative because I have watched with industrial agriculture how they can take a famine of 1942 and bring it to 1965 and present all the pictures of the famines of 42 under British rule and make it look like they got us out of the famine with chemicals. So I did research, I wrote a book and there's a reader out in the United States and I'm so grateful to Wendell Berry. He's the, written the foreword for Kentucky University Press. It's called that, Re I think the Vandana Shiva Reader on Agriculture. But everything I've learned about agriculture is either directly from the earth and her biodiversity or for the peasants of India, or people like Wendell Berry, people like Albert Howard, because they're the ones who told us how America got unsettled, because I was puzzled. I said, we, we got unsettled, but it did well in America, didn't it? And Wendell solved that puzzle for me. He said, exactly the damage that was happening to Indian farmers was already the harm that had taken place in America and the small farmers had disappeared. And then the GMOs came and the patents came and started to save seeds. And in a way, you know, in a positive way, in a constructive way, the seed and the soil has shaped my life since 84. And in a warning way, the poison cartel has constantly woken me up and said, oh, we are ready with the next trip the next genetic engineering, the next poison, the next deregulation, the next narrative that can spin around the world. So it's been, uh, you know, I did, I spent two and a half years, three years doing a PhD in quantum theory. I have spent 38 years trying to figure out agriculture. That's remarkable, Vandana. You, you know, I, I myself include, I, I include myself in this list. I'm ceaselessly amazed by how few people know the sources of modern agriculture and where our food is coming from. And I believe that in, under, in order to understand regenerative agriculture, we need to understand the industrial agriculture that we are currently surviving upon. And certainly everybody is, that reads the news is seeing what's going on now with the, sh the fertilizer shortages and the wheat shortages due to the war in, in Ukraine and the, short, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the hold back on wheat in Russia as well. So everybody's getting a sense of what's, in, what's involved in that. But you referred a minute ago to the Green Revolution of the 50s. So when people hear Green Revolution, which is a great marketing term, they don't really understand that it's based on fossil fuels. Could you say a little bit about that before we talk about regenerative agriculture? I think most people don't know that the fossil fuel based agriculture, the tools for this were actually the same tools that Hitler used to kill people in the concentration camps and during the wars. And even though you know, there's Hell's Cartel sitting in front of my desk. I.G. Farben was put on trial during, you know, after the wars in Nuremberg, the entire human rights edifice came out of that. But with I.G. Farben was Standard Oil. Standard Oil was supplying the fossil fuels and the finances, including in Auschwitz. And the chemistry was coming from the I.G. Farben labs. So what are the two chemicals that are so dominant in industrial agriculture, synthetic fertilizers, 
based on fossil fuels, uh, a kilogram of uh, nitrogen fertilizers uses two liters of diesel. And then of course it does everything else. It emits nitrous oxide, 200 300 times more damaging to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And if you look at the, the, and I'm at the book um, has these violations of the, of the planetary boundaries. And I don't know how in the movement on climate change, the two things that don't get talked about, agriculture doesn't get talked about, but you know, this is a violation of planetary boundaries. That's the nitrogen rupture. And that's because we became addicted to fossil fuel-based synthetic chemicals. And this other one is the biodiversity rupture. So why did we give up biodiversity? Because everything is based on biodiversity. We can do everything in the world. You know, I, I'm born in a pre-fossil fuel India, pre-chemical era. So I have seen how every bit of clothing, every dye, the, the dye of the sari is a natural dye. How all the food we grow, every medicine, yeah, can come from biodiversity. Why did monocultures have to become dominant? A few crops, originally rice, wheat, corn, but with the genetic engineering, corn, canola, soya, cotton, because those were the four they genetically engineered and Monsanto had the patents, and that's what spread. But when you apply chemicals, then all the plants will have all kinds of growth. And you don't want that, you know, because now it becomes competitive because it's an external input. In an ecological input system, there's beautiful harmony between the different plants, the pulses are fixing the nitrogen. I mean, I, I find it fascinating, Michael, how the West has got so obsessed with plant-based proteins. Well, we were doing dals forever. And I know in Omega, you sell wonderful dal. Plant-based protein, we, we knew these beautiful nitrogen-fixing plants give free nitrogen to the soil and the plant and give us protein. Why are you pretending like it's one big innovation now that it has to be done in lab and make a fake impossible bug? Uh, this desperation to prove inventiveness and deny existence of nature in nature, in cultures, is for me fascinating. But Biodiversity was destroyed because you had to provide this military input of NPK. And you had to have rows of just wheat, just um, rice, just corn. But when you apply the chemicals, of course, you have to get rid of the associate plants and you have to get rid of mixtures. But what I realized was we, in, in most traditional cultures and indigenous cultures, we used the sunshine and photosynthesis to the maximum, yeah? Not, no, for, not for a one-dimensional farming or one purpose. So our plants were tall varieties where the straw went back to the soil or to the animals as food, and the grain was used by humans. We didn't feed animals grains and we didn't drive cars on, on corn. You know, you're the big debate in the United States right now on biofuel and use subsidies to fight the war against Russia by putting more biofuel in the cars. But that means taking more food away from people, taking more land away from care. So this biodiversity disappearance that is the other boundary is also related to the fossil fuel driven chemicals. External inputs require monocultures. So you have a package of industrial agriculture that comes out of the military mind of extermination. And therefore, when it's used in agriculture, it exterminates plants, herbicides, exterminates insects, pesticides, fungicides, mycorrhizal fungi. You need them desperately. And when you destroy the beneficial, you get the pathogens. So... It's a system that really began as war and has continued the war against nature. And what I've learned in these nearly four decades is, just like in the economic system, all justification of destruction of nature, of forests, of rivers, is based on the assumption of GDP, which also came out of the wars. You know, how to mobilize society's resources to finance 
more tanks, more uh, planes. And that's how the gross domestic product was created. It was a siphoning out of the wealth of society. Instead of maintaining the wealth of society in circular economies, it was extracted. But the equivalent of this in agriculture is what I call the high yield measurement. And I looked very carefully in Punjab and I calculated, I said, so what do they really measure? They measure what left in a truck from the farm. The soil health is not measured. The farmer's economy is not measured. The quality of the food that came out of the farm is not measured. And all you have is a truck's measurement or weight. I said, that's not an appropriate measure, either on ecosystem level or the fact that food is vital, food is nourishment. So I evolved the indicator of health per acre and nutrition per acre. And when you do an honest assessment from the lens of biodiversity, we realize by conserving biodiversity, using native seeds, doing ecological agriculture, we can feed two times India's population with a full, healthy, nutritious, balanced diet. And I would say it applies to the world because the destruction of biodiversity is actually a decrease in the nutritional availability to the soil and to people. And our health and the soil's health is not separate. I, that's a, a wonderful, succinct uh, description of how we got where we are. And it also, I'm struck by how it points out, at least in the old paradigm, the, the I don't mean the ancient, I mean the, the modern paradigm, how, how we have separated out. Monoculture also requires separation into different categories and, and, and siloing. It, things are in different silos, and that includes culture. I mean, we separate agriculture from our own culture and our own communities, and that is something else we lose. We lose not just uh, plant biodiversity and insect biodiversity, but cultural biodiversity, too. And I know that your work has really intimately in, been involved with, with the rights of women, with uh, indigenous peoples and in traditional culture. And would you say something about how that interacts with what you just described? Yeah. You're so right about the silos, because take, take a seed, a, a, a indigenous seed, the kind of seeds we save in Navdanya. We've saved about 4,000 varieties of rice. This beautiful land in India, had, the peasants had evolved 200,000 rice varieties out of one grass. That is the brilliance of breeding. One mango, mango, mangifera indica, 1,500, every mango a different taste growing in a different part of India, never growing all around the year in a pale, yellow, tasteless form that is mango-looking, but is not a mango. Um, that's what the Del Montes and others try and, uh, and push all the time on us. Um, agriculture means culture and care of the land. So agriculture itself has got separated from culture and care. Um, the biodiversity has got separated from production. Production is now linear uh, crops with heavy fossil fuels. So much work has been done that 10 units of fossil fuel inputs are used to produce one unit of bad food when you can use one unit of external energy to produce 10 units of nourishing food. The having can turn seed into non-renewable seed, soil into an empty container where you pour nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. You've created this strange system where anti-agriculture, uh, agriculture that works against the land is described as scientific. And the cultures that gave us the knowledge of turning a grass into 200,000 rice varieties, giving us knowledge of Ayurveda, that you must eat eight tastes and eat diversity because diversity is what nourishes the diversity of your gut. And now suddenly there's this fashion, of, oh, we'll rewild and drive the peasants of the land. Yeah. Um, and that is, I'm looking at that very closely. In fact, I'm, I'm doing my new book and I'm looking at how fast they're using every word we have used, flipping it to mean the opposite, but the divisions carry on. For me, wild is not where people are not. That was the colonial separation. Wild is where you let things be. Wild is where the seed can become seed. Wild is where the peasants can stay on the land. Wild is where 
our gut can flourish with a hundred trillion microbes. You know, a healthy gut is a wild gut. A wild mind is an imaginative mind of the kind you were describing. So indigenous people had wild minds and the colonialism with this linear mechanistic militaristic idea of uniformity has treated wilderness as the absence of humans. And then Again, the every wildlife of conservation has been removed the humans and the latest, all the financial jugglery of nature-based solutions and carbon sequestering and solving climate change, it is all based on removing the humans again. And this is where you've to, we've to all unite in one beautiful unity of humans as part of the earth, working for a true regeneration through diversity, diversity in the biological world and diversity in our cultural worlds. When you describe it, it becomes so clear and yet so many people are separated. Uh, and, and part of that is that we ourselves have all been colonized. The land is colonized, our food is colonized, we ourselves are colonized. How do you, rec how do you recommend that we find our way into a decolonization process for ourselves? Well, you know, I think the worst thing that we can do to ourselves is work in silos and find the perfect politically correct place to be. A silo never, a silo does not have the right place in an interconnected web of life. Yeah, it doesn't belong. It belongs to monoculture commodity producing farms. That's where you have silos of grain to lay waste or put into cars or put in torture animals. So. I think we've got to come out of the comfort zone because the last, you know, especially in the West, in the industrialized West, the post-war era was an era of movements of specialized kinds, yeah? You had the strong workers movement, and I'm so glad it's coming back in the United States with the Amazon workers uniting and the Starbucks workers organizing again. Uh, we had very strong health movement. We had a very strong women's movement beginning with voting and suffragette movement. Uh, the indigenous movement never really died, but it's become more vocal. Um, the slaves were always rebelling, but the Black Lives Matter has given them, uh, uh, you know, a new voice. But I have watched, you know, too long, too many times, a divide and rule policy is put into place. And people spend more time, energy, fighting each other or proving the other wrong. I think the only thing we need to do is turn to the earth. And because the earth is alive, take instruction from her. What I've learned, you know, I, I, I worked on non-separability for my PhD thesis. And that's where I, you know, got the intellectual thinking about non-separation. But the ecological thinking of non-separation and the earth being alive has really come through the practice of Navania over all these many years. And what I've learned is humility of the highest kind. I learned my first lesson of humility from Chipko. But the new lesson of humility is, after all, those who wanted to do industrial agriculture wanted to control the seed, control the soil, control the plant, wipe out the biodiversity as weeds and round up and spray them out. But even the good people carry this burden that they have to fix it all. You know, it's all on them. And when you start thinking like the earthworm and you start thinking like the mycorrhizae and you start thinking like the roots of the plant, then your mind shifts to service. What is the little bit I can do? Because we are in this amazing universe, a living soil, a living earth, which is doing all the amazing work. Our work is to not allow the harm. And that's why resistance, creative resistance, has to be a vital part of our work today. But the second is constructive service for the earth so that the earth can provide for us. There needs to be no hunger. There needs to be no disease. There needs to be no homelessness. There needs to be no unemployment. The earth, after all, is waiting for all these hands to turn to her service. So we've got to get out of the anthropocentric trap, the silo movement trap, and I think most seriously this year, 
the Earth Day is invest in the planet. Mm. But sadly, those who are promoting this have already said, wow, the kind of way we made money by selling the same house through derivatives and securities. And of course, they don't know or not, they brought the Wall Street down and crashed the world's economy. But they're really applying those algorithms to say, wow, now we can build nature's economy by taking every ecosystem, every river, every photosynthesis of a planet and trade it, own it as an asset and then trade it. And you know what they're looking at? The dollars they're seeing, 4,000 trillion. In a period of collapse by selling nature again and again and her derivatives. So I think it is really time to stand strong with the earth and say quite clearly, the earth is not for sale. Oh, oh. how beautiful you said that. Um, and you, you, I was going to ask you, people need to understand that you yourself are not um, a passive observer. You are very much an activist who have, you have taken on many corporations, you have taken on, You've taken on the military science that has divided up our planet and is selling it off. Uh, could you say a little bit about the, to all of the activists out there who are watching, can you say something about what it means to be an activist and how one can be an activist without losing sight of the, the beauty of life and the, and, the, and, the, and the joy you experience in nature? I mean, the first thing to be an activist of the earth, for the earth, is always turn to the earth for inspiration and turn to the earth for instruction. Okay. Of course, as, a, as part of the earth, we have to be observant. We have to keep track of where things are happening. So, you know, I observed my state in Punjab erupting in violence. And I looked at where did these chemicals come from? Um, I looked at the city of Bhopal in same year, 1984. Bhopal, this pesticide plant owned then by Carbide, after that by Dow, which is now this new wonderful name called Corteva, Dow DuPont come together. All that asked, made me ask the question, where did these poisons come from? Then I found out the poison cartel. So you have to observe them, you have to study them, but always, always do not let their thinking take over your mind. And do not let the kind of fear and domination they want to create over your life enter your fearlessness. So they rule by making you panic, showing their power, and basically troubling on a scientist. We've seen so many of them. But I haven't seen a single real scientist who stopped doing honor science. And I have been threatened enough. I've had lots of company of Monsanto and their trolls. And even now, and they, they keep very busy. You know, when I think of how many, none of them do it out of their own free thinking. It's, you know, they're doing it because someone's paying them to be a troll. And I said, my God, what a huge army of unemployment created for something useless. Why don't you just go plant a garden? Do you, do you have any thoughts about... I mean, you've talked about how divided we all are and how that serves the, to keep us in a state of dom a fearful domination. Uh, do you have any thoughts about social media and its role in that? I have a lot of thoughts about that. And, you know, I, in fact, wrote a book with my son after 2015 when I watched Mr. Bill Gates take over the climate summit in uh, Paris. Now, everyone talks about the Paris summit as, ooh, what a big threshold. But it was a nothing summit because already in Copenhagen, the treaty had been killed, the binding, legally binding obligations of the polluters had been knocked out. And these were voluntary commitments. But what the voluntary commitments would be was being laid out by Mr. Gates. And at this COP in Glasgow, he took it over totally. Geoengineering, new genetic engineering through CRISPR, um, fake food, fake breast milk, fake meat. And of course, he's worked out all the patterns, all the returns on investments. So I have watched, not only since 2015, how the tech giants with their social media platforms are, of course, part of the 1%. 
And they have already divided the world into two categories. Those who will, they will allow speech to, and those whose speech they will take away. And of course you have the famous Citizens United which gave speech to the corporations. But when corporations have too much speech through money, then free citizens lose their speech and democracy dies. What, you know, what are the social platforms? Friends on Facebook, and then they sell that data to Cambridge Analytica. They create messaging in political campaigns on hate. We've watched this. I have watched, but the attacks on me, I was told that the attack on me will always be on top because the Monsantos pay for those attacks to stay on top. You pay $25,000 or something to get you on the top of the search engine. And, you know, I wrote a little book, Michael, during the COVID and lockdown, because I was watching new patterns come out in a hurry. And, uh, and they were on very foundational things, like this impossible burger. Then there was the one on uh, nanoparticles uh, for solving anemia and iron deficiency by Google, who said, got to defeat Mother Nature forever. And then Microsoft, pattern that we are reduced to users and, uh, and the machines will judge our worth and we'll be allocated social credits, et cetera. So they've got all this business plan in mind. And it isn't just social media, it is the tech giants. And there was a very good book done just before censorship, Surveillance Capitalism by Susanna Zuboff. She's a Harvard professor. And she has shown, I mean, I think I in fact have it as, I mean, you know, my, my cap computers are supported by a pile of books. Uh-huh. But luckily, though, because this book is heavy, I have to use this to support my computer. But let me distract. This is the book. The it's Age of Surveillance book. Capitalism by Susanna Zuboff. I think anyone who wants to understand what's happening with the tech platforms and social media, please read this because she's made it so clear. We are the new raw material. We are the new mind. The algorithms are the new processing plants. And the product, industrial product coming out of it is the behavioral modification of the human being. Just look at the literature. Look at who's doing what. So not only is it about spreading hate and division in society, but it is worse, it's taking away human autonomy. The ability to choose right and wrong, the ability to walk the path of right action, the path of dharma. And I think that has to be our immunity, not just the immunity of the gut with healthy food, but the immunity of the being with healthy thinking. Now that, that is so well, so well said and so, so beautiful in an image. The, the, the last line you said, I, I wonder if we could, before we open up to questions, if you could say a bit more about regenerative culture in, as a whole, how it will help reduce poverty, how it will help liberate women, how it will help fight yeah. climate change. So, you know, my new book is Greed to Care. And uh, it grew out of a, um, a lecture I was to have done just before COVID. Um, I would have gone for the lecture, COVID stopped it, but I'd written it and I sent it. And then the publishers wanted to turn it into a book. So I have this book out in Italy called Greed to Care. So I went deep into how did we come up with this idea of the economy? And I realized, well, it's never been the economy. The economy is the art of living or economia. Crematistics is the art of money making. What we call economy is purely the art of money making. The economy is relationships in nature, with nature, in community. And therefore, the extractive model became the dominant system because you've got to pull out of nature and turn it into cash. You've got to pull out of society and exploit and not, not return. So regeneration is first remembering the earth is alive. She's generative. She's not raw material. She's not inert. She's not terra nullius. She's not in dead matter. She is alive. She's Gaia. She's terra madri. She's Vasundara. So, so anything generative will regenerate. 
So regenerative cultures are waking up to the aliveness and generative power of the earth. All regenerative cultures are awake to their regenerative powers in co-creation with the earth. Because we have been, over the last few decades, we've been made to believe we can't live without money. And all the means of living have been taken away. Yeah. I watch this with our peasants now as they're displaced from land. Otherwise, they had everything they needed. But if you're a peasant, you're free. That's why when I was fighting for f- farmers' rights in the GATT and 500,000 farmers at a rally in Bangalore, and Jose Lutzenberger, the environment minister from Brazil, was with me. And he said, Vandana, I now understand why they want GATT, why they want WTO. I now understand why they want to wipe out the last farmer. Because the farmer, as a farmer, you are the ultimate free regenerative producer. For everything else, you need to get something from somewhere, produce it, sell it somewhere else. But when you regenerate the earth as a small farmer, all you have to have is you and the earth. And you're producing the most essential thing we need, food. So regenerative cultures have to now start putting priority to what we really need. If you look at what's happening around the world, as you mentioned, you know, the wheat crisis, the food crisis, the fertilizer crisis, now is the time to wake up and say, let's start becoming sovereign in food. Individuals, communities, regions, countries. We have all that it takes. We know how it takes it. What's blocking it is the propaganda and and anti-science, pseudoscience of the poison cartel. But around you in uh, Omega, look at the number of organic farms. And I think we just need to keep doing that. And regeneration means just like I said, two things. The earth is generative and she can regenerate and we don't have to panic. You know, I, I, our own farm was a barren wasteland, barren wasteland. We, of course, saved seeds, but we planted a few seeds of plants. We've got, I don't know, about 100 times more plants that have come up on their own. We have birds that return on their own. We have six times more pollinators on the Navdanya farm than in the forest next door. And our water level has come up 70 feet just because we stopped doing harm and we started taking care of the earth. So regenerative cultures is really nonviolent cultures, cultures that make peace with the earth, cultures that see abundance of the earth and nature when it is there and are not blind with what I have called the monoculture of the mind. I think one of the worst toxic legacies we have of the industrial age is the monoculture of the mind. We need a a biodiversity of the mind and become one with the biodiversity of the world and do our bit and the rest will regenerate. That's that's so beautiful. Yeah, I'm I'm also aware that you you pointed out Omega is in a very beautiful area surrounded by many many farms, many organic farms and a lovely, healthy watershed and the Hudson Valley region. Uh, But so many of our viewers and so many people live in megacities. So how can someone living far from farms support that, that worldview and restore themselves and be part of the larger movement? You know, I, I do feel we are at a very, very strange moment of human evolution because, you know, there are those who say 99% humanity will be useless. Zuckerberg said it at Harvard, 99% humanity will be useless. We are watching in New York City, people losing homes, you know, being thrown out of the streets and then the police throwing them out off the street too. So I'm watching this violence in the mega cities. And I think before the violence gets to, I mean, and, and look at the blasts that have taken place in the subways in New York. Uh, you know, everyone's being kept busy with, with Russia and Ukraine, but look at the violence everywhere. You know, because as uh, as people's means of living are taken away, the peace in community breaks. And then everyone is like an enemy and everyone is committing, uh, is a threat to you. So I would say, if you can grow your food, 
I've seen in New York, I've visited so many urban gardens and people with commitment just said, oh, this empty parking lot, let's turn it into a garden. I have visited so many areas where the terraces are now gardens. The balconies are gardens. I have visited families in New York City who turned their terraces into gardens and are feeding themselves everything they need. So all that is possible. And the cities are where the shift in the food system is taking place. Um, there's a very, very good Milan manifesto, which was done at the time of the uh, Milan Expo, but the cities came together. It's called an urban pact. And the same principles that we practice in Navdanya, more and more cities are saying, this is what we have to practice. The second thing we have to do is, we plan for watersheds for our cities and our communities. It is time to start planning food sheds for our cities and our communities. For, for cities, it could be, these will be the zone, a hundred mile zone from where we get our food. But the CSAs are already a food shed. Amazing work has been done on that. Link to a farmer. Don't go buy anonymous food because that anonymous food will disappear. So far it's toxic, so far it's chemical, so far it's GMO, then it'll be fake food. You know and won't know what you're eating. And you have to take care of those 100 trillion fellow beings in you, in your gut. You might not know, the label won't tell you, but they will know and you'll be very, very sick. 75% of the chronic diseases are food related. 90% of the people who died during COVID, including in New York, had comorbidities, which came from bad food. They were people who were eating junk food because it's cheaper, because of all kinds of, of uh, distortions in the financial economy and the pricing. Higher cost systems become cheaper in the market. The low cost systems become more expensive. And so we need to start knowing the truth of the cost of anything. And there's nothing like a relationship. And that's why the CSAs are revolutionary. Know your farmer, know how the food was grown. And finally, ensure that you join the democratic processes wherever you are to ensure whether it's the canteens, it's the cafeterias, it's your schools. And sadly, the mayor in New York is already serving fake food to the schools. It is tragic, um, but I don't think we need fake food. I think growing good food is gratitude to the earth. Eating her real food is honoring the earth. And I think we must get out of all of the industrial misconception that the more you can twist and manipulate and engineer anything, it is somehow an improved product. In the case of food, it definitely doesn't work that way. So let us turn food into our connection with the earth, with our health, with the planet, with the farmers, and rebuild society and rebuild communities from the ground up with food as the currency, food as the web. That is marvelous. I, from your lips to goddess's ears, I totally agree. <laughs> Uh, we have some questions. I'm looking at some questions in the chat and one jumped up right away because it related to what you were just saying about urban gardening. Alyssa asks, Alyssa Beth asks, please speak to people producing food for self and neighbors and community in their small lawns that are often still laden with herbicides, pesticides and fungicides. Deep gratitude. You know, in the, in the 60s, I think to 62, we had a China war. And we had this wonderful prime minister who gave a call to all of us, give up your lawns, grow wheat, grow food. And everyone did. He asked all of us to give up luxuries and serve the country. And people did. The same prime minister is the one who said no to the green revolution. He said, I cannot experiment with a country as large as India. Let me try it out on a very small scale. If the chemicals do well, I will, of course, allow you to bring them. He was telling the Americans. And um, he died mysteriously in Tashkent. And then the pressure kept coming. So lawns to gardens has to be a very important movement for our times. And I think it's extremely important for anyone, you know, if you have neighbors, 
let them know of all the court cases that are already taking place in America. The Johnson case, but there's so many cases. There was one in Missouri the other day in Kansas City uh, where Hugh Grant had been brought, was being asked to come to the courts and he's saying, no, 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 it'll disturb me too much. I said, it didn't disturb you to spray around up a cancer drug on all the lawns of the world and all the wheat fields and corn fields of the world. So I think a little bit of mutual education is a very, very important thing, but not in a preachy way, not in a guilt creating way, but in a way to say, protect your health and protect your health both by getting rid of the poison, but growing the food without the poison. That's well said. Another question. Um, Regarding uh, forever chemicals and microplastics, Lois said, recent findings of PFAS having permeated living forms everywhere, including trees, seem to indicate a tremendous injury to the ecosystems of the earth for generations and a serious impediment to hope for a return to a fully nurturing true biodiversity. Please comment. Yeah, yeah I have learned both through my own body as well as work with the earth, that the earth ha has tremendous capacity to heal. And that is no excuse to continue to spread microplastics. And I find it abhorrent that so much plastic is entering agriculture directly because you've messed up the soil so much with Roundup that there are all kinds of pathogenic fungi. So to protect the soil, now you put plastic layers and then that goes into the soil. And the FAO has done a warning. But I think decontamination, I watched, you know, when the tsunami hit India, we took seeds of soil tolerance and a layer of muck had come from the bottom of the ocean. And, the farm, and farmers had been told you won't be able to farm. So we just gave a lot of nitrogen fixing green manures and we gave the soil tolerant rice seeds to the farmers. It came back in a season. Then we worked on the soil. The toxic had all been removed by the green manures. In Fukushima, after the disaster, the organic farmer said, we won't give up. After a season, they measured the soils. Organic farms had ma managed to get rid of radiation. The chemical farms had not been able to do a thing. So the, when we say the earth is alive, the Earth's ability to detoxify is part of that aliveness. And in a way, when you know, why, why do so many people come running to India for detoxification in the Ayurvedic places in Kerala? Because, the, you know, two weeks in one of those places, you get rid of all the muck. And like I said, that does not mean we do not um, resist and prevent the harm. We've got... I have learned in life that you've got to do two things together. With one hand, plant a seed. With the other, shut the door on everything that's causing harm. Every toxic, every GMO, every war. You've got to say, no, I will not participate in that. I'm not part of your game. But always be ready to do the regeneration, regenerative work. And sometimes so much of the work we do makes it look like it's a linear trajectory, but the earth is not linear, yeah? And, and I think the idea of forever chemicals, yes, forever chemicals, if we do not allow the amazing process of the earth and step out, it's the same with fossil fuels. Our work has shown, you know, my books are not all, the regenerative movement, that if today we stop the use of fossil fuels in 10 years, through the healing cycles of the earth, through the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycles and the drawdown and the liquid carbon pathway, you literally in 10 years could take that excess nitrogen and carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but you've got to stop the fossil fuels. You can't keep doing the harm and expect any correction. It's a lot of people despair. They, people have been reading uh, the IPCC reports. They hear about uh, things are all, the, the mantra seems to be in the news. Scientists say things are worse than we thought or happening faster than we anticipated. And so there's a sense of despair. How do people, how do people take action with, and, 
and continue to have hope in the face of all this? <sighs> well, you know, if, if people were also reading the examples of all the regenerative initiatives or visiting regenerative farms, mm -hmm. you would read that IPCC report with a pinch of short salt. Why would you do that? Because so much, you know, for me, it's sad because when I started in, uh, with these international treaties, you know, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UNFCC were signed together at Rio. And they were twin treaties. And biodiversity was supposed to be the solution to climate change. Get out of fossil fuels, shift to biodiversity. Biodiversity will do its work of the biosphere linking to the atmosphere, healing the climate system. All the science was known. But we kept forgetting that the earth is alive and that there's a biosphere. And I think that forgetting is what makes those who only look at the movement of pollution in the atmosphere, they never look at the interface between the biosphere and the atmosphere, because that's where the miracle is happening. That's where the photosynthesis is happening, pulling down the carbon dioxide with the free energy of the sun. You know, people send me these photos of miles of solar panels. I said, why is there still this anthropocentric arrogance? that the only way to harvest solar energy is through a panel that's human made. Why can't we see that every leaf of every plant is a solar panel, but it is not just creating energy. And in the case of the solar panels, creating a consumptive energy, but in the case of the leaf, it's creating regenerative energy. Carbon dioxide, the energy of the sun, turned miraculously into the molecule of life, the carbohydrates, and even more miraculously into the oxygen that we breathe. So therefore I feel if we can just look enough, give ourselves enough time to look at the miracle technologies of nature, to look at the regenerative initiatives of people, we would not be in despair. Mm. We will take into account and seriously the severity of the crisis, but we would not see it as a linear, unstoppable thing. We would realize that is part of one path, but there are other paths available to us, particularly if we turn to the earth and through the earth find the solutions. In any case, the most important point is this, everything we need to do to mitigate climate change is the thing we'll have to do to create resilience to climate change. So whether you believe in climate change or not, whether you want to work on solutions or not, you will have to build resilience. And resilience will only come from biodiversity, organic soil, decentralized food systems. They will not come from long distance supply chains, monocultures of chemicals where the soil has no water holding capacity. This will not come from continued dependence on fossil fuel supplies and fertilizer supplies that will come crash with every war. Uh, that, is, that is such a great reminder. And we get so inundated with the one kind of science, the anti-life science, that we forget that there is an earth-centric science that is, that is indeed scientific. It is based on cause and effect and observation and careful experimentation and generations of knowledge. And so turn to the earth is really a, a wonderful advice for all of us who, who need our hope restored. Um, somebody, I have two more questions here. Someone's asking about, uh, you've talked about hemp in the past. Is hemp a good biofuel? Is it a good thing for the planet? Is it, it doesn't need much fertilizer? Is it good for carbon sequestering? Number one, anything that becomes a monoculture will become bad. Mm. So you need diversity. There are many plants that don't require too much water, that produce a lot of biomass, that produce both fiber and food, all the qualities of hemp. But, you know, the minute we shift to a monoculture of that mind, even good things turn bad. But the second is, there's a lot of patenting going on. And so if you say, oh, let's all grow this, and then it's in the hands of one company, that is not going to be a solution of regenerative agriculture because it will not be in your hands. So diversity, 
no matter what, in plants, in culture, in thinking, in markets, in economies, in knowledges, um, we don't have an escape from that because we are in a world that is that way. So the more we have to wed to a biodiverse world, we'd better be more biodiverse ourselves. Well said. Uh, Vanana, a final question. Uh, so much of this could be averted or healed if our children were taught about this at an early age. Can you say anything about childhood education and, and who was making a difference in that world? Yeah. Um, it was very interesting because, you know, after COVID, everything went online. And of course, the technology platforms did very well. India, which has universal right to education, even the poor people were going to school, especially in Kerala, where it's 100% literacy. Kids were going to their local school. Their father could be a daily wage laborer, but they were going to school. And suddenly your education became dependent on a smartphone which a daily wage labor can't afford. 50% of the children lost their right to education. So recently there was a big debate on India's education policy and the big IT guys were talking about it's inevitable, everyone will have to only learn online, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I was asked to speak and I said, well, we work with children to grow gardens. We work with children on nutritional and health literacy. We work with children on ecological literacy. and." Um, and we started to talk about the, the fact that learning from nature, being with nature, is such an important education. And then it's amazing how all of these IT giants flipped and said, yes, you know, a lot of people are having a lot of mental breakdown with only digital learning. Yes, you are right. People should go out to nature. So I feel that it is extremely important that young people, should turn to nature as their main teacher. And that's why we have the Earth University at Navdanya. That's why we have Gardens of Hope in so many schools. And, and it's interesting, I have, even during COVID, I've addressed schools in New York where the children were being asked to start doing gardening and little kids, six years old, asking the most beautiful questions. So it is a movement and the children are already, are absolutely ready. And we need to turn more attention to the loving hands and hearts of the children. This is our future. And that is absolutely true. And Vandana, you, have, you do so much to preserve life on the planet. I, I pray for your continued health and, and strength and many more people can hear you. I pray for that. I pray that we can all be more like you. You're a great example to us all. I can't wait to have you come back to Omega sometime in the future physically and to see our I gardens. look forward to it too. I've always enjoyed my visits. And, and I also want to thank you for being, I, I want to acknowledge you're eight hours away from us right now. You're much later in our yeah, time zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 10.30 so, now. Yeah. So thank you so but, much for yeah. making, for this generous amount of your time. And we really appreciate it and you. And I hope people will look at Vandana's books and also check out Navdanya, N-A-V-D-A-N-Y-A. -A. Navdanya is Vandana's organization. They do amazing work. Thank yeah, we, so we do a course in October, Michael, called Return to Earth, precisely on these issues. Oh. And it's, it's practical. It's scientific. It's... It's the peasants teach and some scientists teach and we all join. And there is not a person who's been to Navdanya and not gone away totally empowered and out of the despair trap. We don't have the luxury of despair. We don't. We do not. Vandana, Vandana Shiva, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you and love to everyone at Omega and all the listeners. Thank you. And a happy Earth Day to everyone. Oh, by the way, I am doing a session just to greet people. People were asking me. I said, okay, I'll join you for Earth Day. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.